Okay. Can anybody tell me an interesting fact about this sentence? Yes? Yes, it's a palindrome, which means uh, it's the same forwards and backwards if you ignore the, you know, the punctuation and letters and stuff. Does anybody know who this is? Oh, yeah, you guys are good. Yeah. Uh, he's a well-known comedian. He's pretty good, pretty funny. He's no Mitch Hedberg, but I like him. Uh, he, I guess he was an undergrad at Yale, and when he was there, he took a math class called Fractal Geometry. And they had to write a final project in this class. And so his final project was he created a 225-word palindromic poem, which is pretty cool. Uh, you might ask, what does that have to do with fractals? I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with fractals, but whatever. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, so here it is. Check it out. Uh, Damn It, I'm Mad by Dimitri Martin. Um, well, you can read it in your spare time. Uh, actually, it's nothing, really, because there's this guy called Lawrence Levine who uh, wrote an entire palindromic novel, apparently, with like 100,000 letters. It's like 30,000 words or something. Uh, it's called Dr. Awkward and Os Olsen in Oslo. Uh, it kind of doesn't make any sense at all, really. Like, this is how it starts. Uh, and like, then it goes on for 160 pages like this, and it ends like this. So I don't know what kind of achievement it is, but it's something. Uh, if you try to read this, you'll experience a lot of suffering. Uh, but probably actually less suffering than if you were like the proofreader of this, to need to check that like he did not screw it up and like actually made a mistake. Uh, it'd probably be easier if he like sent you like a, an electronic version of the the book rather than like a handwritten version. That'd be much easier to check. Um, so suppose actually that he did that, and let me ignore all like the punctuation and whatever. Let's say it's just like a list of letters. Uh, what would be a good algorithm to check whether or not this is a good, like a, this giant text is a good palindrome, is a real palindrome? Oh, you answered the last one. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's basically it. So, I mean, you know, basically put one finger on the first letter and one finger on the last letter and check that they're the same. And then, like, do a loop where, like, you know, you push the one finger forward and the other finger back, right? You increment one and decrement the other and check that it's, like, A, A. And then keep going and it's, like, C, C. And, like, if you ever, uh, you know, find a mismatch, then it's not a palindrome. And then when do you stop? Never. Yeah, basically when they're, well, not quite when they're pointing at the same thing. Well, yeah, once they pass, then you're done. It depends if the length is even or odd. This one actually has odd length. Um, OK, so this is what I wrote down the algorithm for this, which I called two-finger palindrome test. Let's say it takes as input a string s, and let's say it's also just given the length n. And so you want to check if the string from s1 to sn is a palindrome. So I just wrote some little pseudocode here, which I hope you agree will work. Uh, I had a variables low and high. I start them at 1 and n. And then I do a loop. As long as low, the low index is still less than the high, I check if the string characters are not equal. If they're not, then I can immediately say, no, it's not a palindrome. Otherwise, I increment low, decrement high, and keep going. Is that OK? There's no trick. Is you agree that this will work? OK. Um, Great, so this is a sentence that describes some things about that algorithm, and uh, a lot of the lecture will be devoted to like saying what all the words in this sentence mean. Okay, so in particular, one thing we can say is that this two fingers algorithm solves the palindromes problem on size n inputs in worst case time O of n. So I'll explain what all those things mean and more in today's lecture. Uh, one thing I like about today's lecture is it's really about great ideas in theoretical computer science. This is a, I mean, I'll tell you a secret, like some of the things we've talked about so far, like counting, you know, they're related to computer science. I wouldn't say they were invented by computer scientists necessarily. Um, but this lecture in particular has a lot of ideas that are purely, you know, about computer science. So that's one thing I like about it. And just with like the tips on like how to solve proofs, I could only come up with nine, not ten. 
OK. So great idea one is about having great definitions. And uh, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of definitions of some basic concepts. So this sentence actually encapsulates a lot of the important definitions. It says that an algorithm solves a problem if it gives the correct solution on every instance. OK, so now I would like to explain all the words in that sentence. And I'm going to start with this word problem, because computer science is all about problems. OK, so I'll do it a little bit by example. So palindromes is a problem. OK, I'm going to write my problems with this like, small caps font. OK, so palindromes is a problem, whereas like a string like, damn it, I'm mad, is an instance of the problem. OK, you might have thought, oh, yeah, it's a problem given you know, this sentence to determine if it's a palindrome or not. But that's not the right terminology for us. The problem is palindromes, and this is a particular instance, also known as an input. OK, so another potential instance are you know, this string selfless, or this string, this random string. In fact, actually, any string of, let's say, letters is a valid instance or input to the palindrome's problem. OK? And what is the task in the palindrome's problem? It's to come up with the solution, which in this case is yes or no. Is, it, is the instance a palindrome? OK, so uh, the answer or solution for this instance is yes, and this one it's close, but no. You need to knock off that last letter, and this one is no, and this last one is yes. OK, so we got problems, we got instances of problems, and each instance has a solution. OK, so this is like a definition. A problem is an infinite connect collection of instances and solutions. OK, and it's usually they're naturally related in some way. I'll give some more examples so we can be clear on it. Uh, here's another example of a problem. It's called multiplication. It's a simple problem. Uh, and instances of the problem look like this. Basically, an instance is a pair of two numbers, maybe with a multiplication sign in the middle. And of course, the solution is like the answer to the multiplication problem. OK, so we're going to talk about algorithms for the multiplication problem, like this will be the input and these will be the desired output. Let me give another example. There'll be something that goes wrong with this one. Here's an example called uh, chess. All right, so this is chess. You don't really need to know anything about chess for this. Uh, here's a very interesting question. Is this a winning position for white? Okay. <laughs> this is something that you would genuinely want to try to solve with your computer. Okay, but is this a problem in our terminology? I got some conflicting answers. Somebody want to boldly put up their hand? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll take your first half, which is correct. Yes, it's not a problem. <laughs> well, you're, well, we'll get into the second half. But this is not a problem because it's just one question, OK? And just one question, this is a very interesting question, but it's not, it doesn't count as a problem, OK? Because, well, theoretically, I know two different algorithms, each of which is very short, and one of them solves the problem. One algorithm just outputs yes, and one output algorithm just outputs no. Okay, so it doesn't contain any chess knowledge. So one one problem can be one question can be interesting, but it's not a problem. I guess probably the answer to this question is no, right? It's definitely not a winning position for black, but probably not for white either. Okay, so let's try again. Okay, so let's try a problem chess. Now here we give you like an arbitrary position, okay? So there's many different inputs, and the question is yes or no. Is this a winning position for white? So is this a problem now? I got some indiscreet murmurings. How about somebody in the back? Yes? No? No? Yes? Yes? Uh, white. Okay, now that we're talking, though, yes or no? Is it a problem? I'll give you a hint. Okay, this is not okay. I will not uh, uh, continue with that. But uh, no, this still does not count as a problem for us because there are only still only finitely many instances. OK, this board is 8 by 8. There's only some finite number of instances. Granted, it's an enormous one. But in our definition, for you have a real problem, you have to talk about infinitely many problems, or infinitely many questions or inputs. 
Because otherwise, at least in principle, this problem, this problem could be resolved by table lookup. Um, OK, so let me try one more time. Here's a problem called generalized chess. Well, potential problem. And here the instance is a board size and a position. So it's kind of like souped up chess where the, the board does not have to be 8 by 8. And uh, again, the question is, is this a winning position for white? Assume it's white's turn to move. And this is a problem, OK? Great. We finally got a real problem on our hands. Because now there are infinitely many inputs, right? Because the size of the board can be any size. OK, so this is a point I want to emphasize. The problem has uh, infinitely many instances. OK. Uh, great, so that's problems. Let's talk briefly about algorithms. I guess you all kind of know what an algorithm is, and I don't really want to define it. Actually, in lecture 22, in some sense, we will define it. But for now, I guess you kind of know what an algorithm is. It's a well-designed procedure that gets an input and returns an output. And uh, one thing I do want to say is in 251, we're going to write all our algorithms in pseudocode, OK? Because it's about computer science. We're not going to be tied to any particular engineering aspect of uh, programming. We're going to stay at a high uh, celestial level for this class. OK, now what does it mean for an algorithm to solve a problem? This is actually important. We say an algorithm A solves a problem R if it uh, gives the correct output for every input, every instance of the problem. OK, so not just most of them. You know, it's only correct if it solves all the instances. And usually, it takes a theorem to prove that your algorithm correctly solves a problem. And so this is summed up, uh, this whole discussion a little bit summed up by this nice quote by uh, Kleene, who's one of the founders of computer science, who said an algorithm is a finite answer to infinitely many questions. Oops. OK, any questions about algorithms and problems and instances? All right. OK, great idea number two, input size. This is really a feeder into idea number three, but part of the great idea here is to uh, represent things with bits, or write your numbers in binary, which is a well-known great idea in computer science. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the idea of measuring the size of an instance or an input. So uh, almost always, the size of the input is denoted by the letter n. So we'll see the letter n a million times in this lecture. And unless otherwise specified, the input size, the instance size, is defined to be the number of bits you need to specify the instance. OK, because this is the natural input-output format for computers. That said, it's very often otherwise specified. OK, so don't get too attached to this definition. Um, formally, what n means is actually part of the definition of the problem. And so, you know, if you're defining a problem, you can define it however you want. It might not be a great definition, but, you know, a definition can't really be wrong. Uh, so quite often, the notion of what the input size will be will be specified to you, and it won't just be the number of bits. But the default rule is number of bits. So let's talk about that, what, it means, what that means for uh, different kinds of instances. So one common uh, kind of instances, uh, instance for algorithms is integers. Okay, so there are several interesting problems where the input is just a number. And in that case, we really do use the number of bits. So if the instance is called, let's say, capital M, the input size, little n, is like the number of bits you need to specify capital M, which is basically like log base 2 of m. OK, so it's important not to be confused in thinking that like this is the input size. The number of bits of the number is the input size. OK, so here's an example problem where the input is a number, primes. The problem is you're given a number m, and you just have to say yes or no whether or not m is a prime. OK? And you really should get into your head when thinking about problems where the input is a number, the idea that n, the number of bits of the in input, is huge. OK, so think of the case where the number of bits is a million. OK, so when you're thinking about algorithms for trying to check if a number is prime, really imagine not like the number is between one and a million, but like the number has a million digits. OK, so it's enormous, like it's probably stored on a disk somewhere. OK, and so you should think of these as like, you know, big nums. OK, let me just give one more example of a problem where the input is an integer. This is a related problem uh, called factoring. 
And here the input is a number m, and the, the task is to output the prime factorization of m. Okay, and that seems to be a particularly challenging problem uh, to do for, let's say, a million digit numbers. Here's a third problem, multiplication. It's a simple problem we talked about before. The input is two numbers, let's say m1 and m2, and the algorithm's task is to output the product written in binary. Here's an example where it's a bit traditional to not define the input length as the total number of bits. That would be like log base 2 of m1 plus log base 2 of m2, maybe plus a few more bits for like the comma. So it's a slightly more traditional to define n here to be the, the maximum of the two bit lengths. OK, and that's going to be within a factor of two of the total number of bits. And somehow it's just a little bit more convenient. So you can say, you know, multiplication is the problem of given two numbers each of which has at most n bits compute their output. Okay, so this would be an example of, you know, slightly redefining the input size. Questions? All right. Another kind of common kind of instance type is uh, a list or a string or, you know, an array. Uh, and in this case, it's actually usual to define n to be the length of the list even though the list items themselves might be more than one bit. OK? Usually you define n to mean the length of the list. Uh, so an example is this problem, palindromes, we already saw. OK? There the input is, let's say, a string of lowercase letters. The solution is yes or no, whether it's a palindrome. And usually, you know, one would define n to be the length of the string, as opposed to, like, I don't know, I guess to represent it with bits, you might need, like, five times n bits, you know, five bits to capture one letter. OK, it's just a little bit cleaner to use just the length of the string as the input size. And uh, as you'll see, and as you probably already know, we tend to discount constant factors like 5, let's say. So changing by a factor of 5 is not a big deal to us. Here's a another example, it's a little bit more subtle. Uh, this is a well-known problem, sorting. Let's say you're given a list of integers, and the task is to output the sorted version of that list. And here again, we usually write n for the length of the list, even though the integers themselves are probably, you know, fairly big numbers. They might also be on the order of n. Um, and there's actually a few details to think about here in terms of running time and input size, but we'll talk about that towards the end of the class. I just wanted to get to the point that usually n in this context means the number of uh, items in the list. OK, one other common type of input to uh, algorithms is graphs. We're going to talk about graphs in a lot more detail in the upcoming lectures. So you know, if you forget what a graph is, it's kind of OK, but I wanted to tell you about it anyway. A graph is something that looks like this. It has vertices and edges. And here, it actually takes a bit of thought to like, understand how many bits would it take to represent a given graph. How would you store it? And in fact, there's actually a couple of different common ways to store a graph. Probably you may know. Can somebody say the two popular ways to store a graph? Yeah? Yeah, they're called the adjacency list and adjacency matrix. Again, we'll talk about them more in future lectures, but uh, you know, it's a question of whether you keep for each vertex the list of all the other vertices it's attached to, or you just have a big matrix that says for all the pairs of vertices if they're attached or not. Uh, and I would say that for graph problems, the input size is always otherwise specified, because it's you know, quite common to use either of these, and so you really need to say what you mean all the time. The only uh, guidance I can give here is it's extremely common notation to say that n is the number of vertices and m is the number of edges. So we'll see that in the upcoming lectures. OK, that's all I wanted to say about um, input size. Any questions? OK, with that defined, we can now get to sort of what's really the, the greatest idea, at least in the terms of computational complexity theory, which is the idea of measuring the running time of an algorithm as a function of the input size, and doing this uh, in a worst case model. So this was an idea proposed by Hart, Modest, and Stearns in like the late 1960s, and it really sort of started the area of uh, algorithmic and computational complexity. OK, so let's talk about how to measure the running time of an algorithm. Uh, and I'm going to kind of do it by example. Uh, what we want to do in, in, in general is take an algorithm A, like this two fingers palindrome algorithm, and let's say also an instance i, which in this case is a string. 
and just try to count the number of elementary steps the algorithm takes when run on this instance. Now, I'm going to be vague for a while about what an elementary step means, but let's try to just do it uh, in a naive and intuitive way. It'll roughly correspond to, like, the number of lines of the code that get executed. Okay, so let's suppose this is the algorithm and the instance is this string uh, selfless. And let's just try to go through this algorithm and see how many steps it does. So this is the first line. It sets low to be 1. Uh, so it's pointing out this character. Let's just say that's one step. OK, then it sets high to point to n, which is uh, 7 or 8 here. That's this character. Let's say that's one step. OK, the next thing it does is checks if low is less than high. It is, so it goes into the loop. Let's say that's one step. Now it like looks at the first character, and it looks at the last character, and it checks if they're not equal. So uh, I don't know. Let's say that's three steps. I'm just kind of making this up for now, but you know, We'll just be naive about what a step is for now. Uh, so they are equal, so it continues. It increments low. It decrements high. Let's count one each. It goes to the top of the loop. Maybe that's another one. Low is still less than high. OK, now it checks whether this character is different from this character. And it is different. Like, it's found that it's not a palindrome at this point. So say that's three more steps. And then it returns no. And that's one step. So now it's done. And we'll say 14 steps. OK? I mean, I wasn't super precise about what is a step, but this is at least the idea of counting the steps. Great. So these were the sort of step counts that we sort of invented. Um, but now let's you know, forget about uh, this worry for now and say, uh, look at the following question. Suppose I give you a length n input, a string with n characters. It's going to take some number of steps. And we can probably give lower and upper bounds on that, just like we talked about in lecture one. So. Um, a lower bound, you think about the upper bound for a second, but I'll mumble about the lower bound. Uh, I guess the lower bound, I think, is 4, because it's a character. I think the fastest case is if n is 1, in which case you'll do the first line, the second line, and low will already be at least high. So it'll be like one more line, and then you'll return yes. Yep? Uh, it depends if I let n be 0. Uh, well, it's still going to take you a few steps. OK, well, you're still going to do this step, this step, this step, and this step. So I think it's still four. Anyway, uh, that's like the best case. But as I said, we're going to be more interested in the worst case. Um, so can somebody say roughly, like, what's the worst case number of steps? Yeah. Eight or nine, seven over two. Yeah, something like that. Probably what you're going for is like, you know, basically this loop can go a bunch of times. And each time the loop goes, it's like, I think I counted seven. Like one, two, three, four. This doesn't happen. Five, six, seven. So something like, I don't know, a constant number of steps, maybe seven each loop iteration. And in the worst case, it's probably, it probably really is a palindrome. And like low and high move all the way to the middle. So the number of times the loop would run would be something like n over two. OK, so without being super precise, I think it's something like, Maybe I made a mistake, but something like 7 over 2 times n, maybe plus a few extra steps. Is everybody more or less happy with that? Great. OK, so as you can see, we're already kind of like fudging things with like what exactly counts as a step. And we would prefer to just say that this is O of n steps. Now, I guess most people took 151, and you talked a lot about big O notation there. So I'm going to kind of assume you kind of remember it. There'll be a summary towards the end. But basically, this says uh, proportional to n steps is the worst case. Great. So it seems it's more interesting to focus on the worst case. You know, it's not very informative to know that, like, oh, sometimes it might only take four steps. Uh, and so we define the running time of an algorithm A to be a function called time sub A, which uh, maps the number n to this quantity the maximum number of steps that algorithm A might take on an input of size n. OK, so for a given n, you look at like the worst case input of length n in terms of how many steps A takes. OK. Uh, let me do one more example. It'll help us with uh, future topics. Here's another problem I uh, invented called closest pair. The instance is a list of integers. 
And the input size n is defined to be the length of the list. And the solution is the distance between the closest pair in the list. OK? So uh, here's an example. The instance is this list, 39, 18, 88, 115. Uh, the closest two numbers here are 18 and 15, and their difference is 3. Okay, so the answer is 3. Okay, you've got to find the closest two numbers and take their difference. Is it clear? Okay. So, uh, let's, uh, since we're talking about running time, let's give uh, an example. Here's an algorithm I made up for this, which basically is the brute force algorithm. So it sort of uh, says the closest pair so far is whatever, the difference between the first two. And then it tries to check all pairs, like i and j, compute how far apart they are. That's this line. And if that's closer than the closest one seen so far, then set closest so far to be that difference. And OK, return the answer when you've checked all the pairs. Any questions? Yes? Oh, that's a good question. This is the theorem I was going to propose about uh, this algorithm, that my alg solves closest pair. So you disagree with this? OK, we have a disagreement with this, which is good, because I was trying to trick you. The theorem is not true. Uh, so uh, this person had the, the reason. Somebody else want to also say what the reason is? There's a mistake? Yeah? Yeah, this algorithm mistakenly you know, goes i from 1 to n and j from 1 to n, so it, it counts the case i equals j. But you're supposed to be looking for distinct pairs. OK, so what's the simple way to fix this? Yes? Uh, have j run from i plus 1 to n. Yeah, just have j go from i plus 1 to n. OK, so this, this loop, this double loop, i goes from 1 to n, j goes from i plus 1 to n, enumerates all the distinct pairs. OK, so now this algorithm is actually correct, so let's move on to theorem two. Uh, what is the running time of this algorithm? I, I hope you've tried things like this before. Can somebody give me the, the big O running time of this? Yeah, that's good. A lot of people are mumbling n squared. Um, basically because, you know, it's like a double loop. You're kind of doing, I don't know, one or two or three steps or something each iteration. And basically, it's like a double loop over n. You're, Checking n choose two things, that's like n squared over 2. So the running time is proportional at most to n squared. Is that uh, OK? OK. Actually, as a side comment, on this algorithm, it has the property that like the best case and the worst case are sort of the same. Like every instance basically does the whole algorithm. So it also takes like n squared steps. Uh, can you think of a faster algorithm? Good. I'll ask you again on a later slide. Well, think about it. If you, if you can, think about it in the back of your head as I'm talking here for a better algorithm than this. OK, yeah? Oh, good, yeah. Omega is like, I'll get to that too, but omega means, if big O means roughly at most or at most up to a constant, omega means roughly at least or at least up to a constant. OK, so let me give you one slide on the discussion of why we focus mostly on the worst case input. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not dogmatic about it. Uh, it's interesting to study like, what happens for a random input, or what happens for like, a real world inputs, whatever that means. Or there's another kind of analysis called smooth analysis, which is some interesting combination of random and worst case. These are all interesting too. But the best, well, the, at the broadest level, it's nice to study worst case analysis for various reasons. First, it's, you know, if you prove something about worst case running time, it's an ironclad guarantee. And it matches our worst case notion of an algorithm solving a problem, that the algorithm has to work for every input. Um, you know, computer science, in some sense, really developed during like, World War II. And there, like, one of the main concerns was cryptography. And there, you really do think of like, an adversary who's like, feeding you the worst possible instances, who's like, out to get you. So that was part of the mindset. It's also somehow hard to define like, scientifically what like, a real world input means. So you know, to be safe, you can just say, well, I'm going to make sure my algorithm makes a meaningful statement about every input. OK. Any questions about the running time and measuring it in terms of the input size? OK, so great idea number four. Um, 
When it comes to running time, you should focus on the big picture and not the little picture. You should really think about how the running time scales as a function of n, as opposed to what exactly it is as a function of n. So this idea I think you should be familiar with if you studied, let's say, big O notation. Consider the following statement. On input i, algorithm a takes 2,718 steps. I claim this is not a very meaningful statement. First of all, it's not very meaningful because it's just telling you about one particular instance. So eh, it's not too important what happens for one particular instance. You kind of care about all of the instances. So you might say, OK, here's another statement. The running time of A on inputs of size n is at most 18n squared minus 7n plus 92. I feel it's also not really a very meaningful statement uh, for a few reasons. Uh, here are the reasons I thought of. I mean, it's sort of like the too many significant digits problem in, in science, you know? Like, it's kind of too specific. In particular, it's sort of overly dependent on exactly what your notion of an elementary step is. You know, when we were counting the number of steps for the two fingers algorithm, we were like, oh, this one's one, and let's say this one's three. But, you know, a reasonable person might have thought that that one was two or four or something. So, you know, exact counts don't really make that much sense. Uh, at least at this, not level, uh, at this level of precision. And even if you, like, you exactly specify like, the machine model and the, the, the instruction set, like, you know, running time, counting running times is a good proxy for the actual time a computer will take to execute on a given instance. But it still ignores things like uh, the cache and like, the fact that you know, when you read from memory, it actually reads a, like, a burst of like, you know, nearby items. And like, there's disk speed versus processor speed. And, you know, we're abstracting things out here, and abstraction is important. So I want to emphasize that this kind of statement is a little too specific. Instead, we want to emphasize uh, things, you know, like this, that emphasize the scaling, or what happens uh, proportionally as n increases. So we prefer the statement, the running time of algorithm A on inputs of size n is proportional to n squared. Okay, this th theta is the other in this trinity of big O and omega. The other one is theta. Theta means uh, like roughly proportional to up to a constant. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about runtime scaling. Suppose you have an algorithm and the you know it runs in a number of steps that's proportional to n, some constant times n. So maybe it's three times n, or seven times n, or ten times n. Well, one nice thing you can say about it, which does not depend on the exact constant, is this. If you take the algorithm and double the input size, that means the running time will also double. OK? If the running time was really 7.3n, and you double n, it'll still be exactly twice as much. And that's also true if it was 10.1 you know, times n. OK, so this kind of statement gets away from exactly what the constant is and tells you something more meaningful. Similarly, if your algorithm runs in a number of steps proportional to n squared, you could say that doubling the input size means the running time goes up by a factor of 4. OK, and again, that doesn't really de it doesn't depend on what the constant is in here. It's a function of uh, quadratic time. OK, what about n cubed? If I double the input size, what will happen to the running time? Yeah, it'll go up by a factor of uh, 8. OK? And actually, if the running time is anything like n to a constant, we call n to a constant polynomial time. So you know, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, any constant. That means that uh, doubling the input size will make the runtime go up by some constant, specifically 2 to the c. OK, so for example, all these polynomial running times have the property that if you double the input size, the running time will increase by some constant factor, which is a nice thing to know. Contrast this with an algorithm that runs in time like 2 to the n. Now what happens if you double the input size? <laughs> what? Something hilarious. Yeah? Pardon me? Yeah, that's right. If you double the input size, then you know, two, this would go to like 2 to the 2n, which is like the square of 2 to the n. See, so that's a lot different. If you double the input size here, if it ran in 1,000 seconds before, now it's a million seconds. And if you double it again, then it would be um, the square of a million, so whatever that is, 10 to the 12th uh, seconds. OK, so that's a lot. It's a lot different from this kind of behavior. And it's telling us something quantitative or qualitative about the algorithm. Is it a trillion? 
OK, a trillion, yeah. Good. OK, so you may have seen plots like this before, but let me illustrate this with a plot. So here's n, uh, and this plot goes from 1 to 100. And uh, this is a plot of n squared. And this is a plot of n. OK, so you can you know, see there's a difference here. The n squared is a lot bigger than n. Uh, what I wanted to illustrate here, though, is that if you plot 2n, 3n, and 4n, they look like this. They're also straight lines. I hope to kind of illustrate to you that there's something sort of noticeably different. These guys are all kind of similar. They're all straight lines. They're pretty fast. And there's you know, a noticeable difference between that and n squared. Just getting at the idea that the constants don't matter so much as the uh, sort of the exponent. Here's another similar kind of plot. So uh, this one is a log-log plot. And for this one, I just pretended that like one step took one microsecond. Just, I don't know, for fun. So here's uh, n, and it's a log-log plot. So this is 10 to the fourth, this is 10 to the eighth, and this is the number of microseconds. So just for, uh, see, this is one second, one hour, one year, and age of universe. Uh, OK, so n linear time looks like this. You know, you can still run it on inputs the size of a billion, no problem. N squared looks like this. You know, you can still do it for a pretty big input sizes. N cubed, no, actually N cubed is kind of pushing things. Like, okay, maybe you, you make your computer a bit faster, you can do inputs of size, whatever, 10,000, maybe 100,000. Okay, but then 2 to N looks like this, okay? So <laughs> 2 to N, like, you know, as soon as N is 100, it's over. You can never do it. 2 to the 100 is longer than the age of the universe. So, and if you imagine here, right, if you tried to extend this, like, all the way up to get here, it's, it's growing a lot faster. And this is n factorial. It's even worse. <clears throat> I guess the size of the, inter the internet in bytes is like 22 factorial. So you cannot run an n factorial algorithm for very large inputs. OK, so this I think also hopefully illustrates to you that there's something qualitatively different between these polynomial running times and these exponential running times. OK, great ideas number five. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the intrinsic complexity of the problem and the idea of beating brute force algorithms. Okay? Brute force algorithms are ones where running times like 2 to the n or n factorial might come up. OK, what is intrinsic complexity? So suppose I give you a problem like palindromes, and I say, uh, how fast is the fastest algorithm for it? That's getting at sort of the real, true complexity of the palindromes problem. If you use the best algorithm, how long does it take? OK, and this is not 100% precise. You would have to actually fix the model of what an elementary step is and be prepared to not worry a bit about big O's. But it's a reasonable question that we can actually answer. Well, let's see. We know an O of n algorithm, right? We saw this two fingers algorithm that solves the palindrome problem in uh, O of n time. Well, could there be a faster one? Could there be one that's like noticeably faster? Let's say it's uh, O of root n or something. I like von Ahn's banning. Like, you banned, banned. <laughs> no. uh, oh, great. Yes? Yeah, that's uh, an excellent point. The, the answer is no. And uh, one can actually prove it exactly along the ideas you suggested. So in fact, I'll sketch a proof of this theorem, that any algorithm solving the palindromes problem must take at least n minus 1 steps. And the idea, as was suggested, is that you know, if you're going to correctly decide if a string is a palindrome, you kind of have to look at all the letters. And there's n of them, so it should take you like at least n steps, right? Well, you have to be a little bit careful, but you can Make that correct. So here's a proof. Suppose, for the sake of contradiction, that A is an algorithm that solves palindromes, and it uses at most n minus 2 steps. Consider this input, which I call i. It's just the string that's all letter A for length n. That's a palindrome. Now, look what happens when A, or imagine what would happen when A runs on input i. I claim that there have to be two indices, j1 and j2, which are different, such that A never reads i in j1 position or in j2 position. 
Why is that? This is basically encapsulating the idea that was already proposed. Uh, okay. Right, yeah, it's taking, by assumption, at most n minus two steps. I think we can agree that, let's say, reading one element of the array takes step one step. Let's assume that. So then, I mean, it only has time to read, like, n minus two of them at most. So there's got to be at least two, which it does not read. Okay, next trick. Let i prime be another string, which is the same as i, except that you change the j1th character to b, and you change the j2th character to c. Okay, so i prime is basically all a's, but there's like a b somewhere, and there's also a c somewhere. Okay? This is maybe the most crucial line. I claim that when you run a on this new input, i prime, it has exactly the same behavior as when a runs on i. Like the trace is exactly the same. So why is that? Yeah, I mean, A never reads these two positions, and they're the only way in which I and I prime are different. So, like, it has no opportunity to do anything different on I prime than it does on I. Okay, but A says yes on I, because I is a palindrome. And A says no on I prime. Why? Well, it's because it's not a palindrome. If you think about it, if you have a string that's all A's, but has one B and one C, it cannot be a palindrome. Okay, and that's a contradiction. I mean, it contradicts the fact that A solves this problem correctly on all strings. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. Uh, if you want, you can think about, actually, when I first was writing this up, I had at least N here, and I said, you know, suppose it solves palindromes on at most N minus one steps, and I had only one index J here, but then there was a bug at the end of my proof. So if you want to think about why I ran into trouble there, you can also do that while I'm talking. Well, you, you probably maybe you figured it out, but we'll let everybody think of it. Was that a question, or were you going to answer it? OK. I'll ask you later. OK. So anyway, uh, one conclusion of this, you know, there was a little side detour, is that we can say the intrinsic time complexity of palindromes is linear, because you know, O of n time is necessary and sufficient. OK, so really. The best algorithm for solving palindromes is linear. And what the constant is depends on the model and so forth, but we kind of figured it out. OK, let's come back to this closest pair problem. Remember that you get a list of n numbers. You've got to output the difference between the closest two numbers. And we saw an n squared like brute force algorithm that basically just checked all pairs and computed their difference and took the minimum. OK, so is there a faster algorithm? Somebody wanted to tell me over here. Maybe you, yeah. Yeah, that's basically it, uh, the key idea. You should uh, first step sort the numbers. Uh, you probably know, I think you probably know that you can sort a list of length n in time like n log n with a number of different methods like, let's say, merge sort. And then once you have the sorted version of the list, that doesn't change the answer, right? It just rearranges the numbers. But now it's much easier to figure out the closest pair. You just have to check 1 versus 2 and 2 versus 3 and 3 versus 4 up to n. OK, so that'll take like n log n plus another n time. Well, I don't want to get too much into algorithms, so you can think about that if you like. But it's true that you can solve it in n log n time. It's also not too hard to show that at least n steps are required, basically for the same reason as for palindromes. I mean, an algorithm cannot really solve this problem if it doesn't look at all n entries of the list. So now we're pretty close. You might ask, OK, we know at least n, at most n log n, those are pretty close. Is there an O of n algorithm? And uh, someone back there, just scratching the head. Sorry. Uh, yes? Uh, you're saying start from the upper, both sides. Are you saying, like, keep track of the maximum number you've seen so far and the minimum? Mm, I don't quite see how that would work. Um, maybe. Did you have a suggestion?
Well, uh, the proposal is that maybe you can actually sort in O of n time. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe not if, okay, in this problem, the number of digits in each number, maybe we shouldn't assume it's a constant. Because actually, the problem can be solved in constant time if the s integers are bounded by a constant. I'll let you think about why that is. Uh, but actually, it's sort of true. You can actually sort in O of n time depending on your exact model. And I don't want to get into what our exact model is, so I will not belabor this point, but these fine questions about like n log n versus n time, actually now it starts to matter exactly what you mean by an elementary step. So I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end, but let me just say for now, you know, maybe, depending on the model, but this is already pretty good. Somewhere between n and n log n is the true complexity of this closest pair problem. Okay. Let's talk about multiplication. Uh, you got two n-bit numbers, you have to multiply them. In grade school, you learned a quadratic time algorithm. I won't give it, but basically it looks like this, right? You know how to do this. And you gotta fill in all these numbers. There's about n rows, each with about n bits, so it takes you about n squared time. And it's also easy to show that at least n time is required, so we still have somewhat of a gap here, n squared versus n. Uh, is there a faster algorithm for this? Does anybody know? Put up your hand if you know the answer to this question. Okay, a few people know that the answer is yes. It's actually not obvious. You kind of think to yourself, how else can you multiply numbers other than by this, right? That's how you multiply numbers. Uh, but you can be clever, and I'll come back to this point. But sometimes it's not so easy, is what I'm trying to say, to figure out what the true sort of intrinsic complexity of a problem is. Okay, I want to mention two more problems on this subject, uh, both of which are related to graphs, and as I said, we're going to come to graphs more later, so uh, bear with me. Uh, here's a problem called the Hamiltonian cycle. The input is a graph, like this, connected, and n is the number of vertices, and you have to decide, yes or no, is there a tour, that means is there a way to walk you know, from vertex to vertex along edges, so that you start and end at the same place, and each vertex is used exactly once. Let's call the Hamiltonian cycle. This graph has one. You can start here and go ding, 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 and you hit each vertex exactly once. Okay, so there's a brute force algorithm for trying to solve this problem. Can somebody, well, I'll ask it a different way. The brute force algorithm is to just list all possible ways of visiting the vertices exactly once and check to see if the required edges are there. How many steps roughly does that take? Yes? Yeah, n factorial. There's like n factorial different ways to arrange the n vertices. So that's kind of slow. Uh, in 1970, uh, Held and Karp came up with a pretty clever way to solve the problem using dynamic programming, if you know what that is. Their algorithm took two to the n steps. Also pretty slow, but it's better than n factorial. And uh, that was basically it for an extremely long time until a guy called Bjorklund in 2010 you have a very clever algorithm based on algebra. It's also still brute force in some way, but it takes this many steps, something like 1.657 to the n. So okay, if this you could run on like n maybe of size 10, this one maybe you could do on size 20, maybe you can do this one on size 30. This is pretty awesome actually. I, was, I refereed this paper and when I first saw it, I was like, there's no way this paper is right, right because, I don't know, this paper had been around for like 40 years. It seemed impossible to beat two to the n, but he did it. it was pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, still, though, this is pretty slow. Uh, actually, one of these two guys is Bjorklund. Can you guess which one? Yeah, everybody's got it right. It's the guy on the right. I don't know. Maybe he looks more like a computer scientist for some reason. Okay. Uh, here's an extremely similar sounding problem called Eulerian cycle. Very similar. Input is a graph, connected. Instance size is n, the number of vertices. And now you're asking, is there a tour that visits each edge exactly once? In this case, no, you say. Uh, yeah, you can come close. Like if you go here, here, wait a minute, here. Okay, maybe you can't even come that close. Here, 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 here. Okay, you can actually cover all the edges exactly once, but uh, you won't start and end at the same spot, which you need to do. Yeah, so you can come close. Uh, so this is a no instance. 
Anyway, it sounds very similar, right? Now here's an algorithm called algorithm E. Go through every vertex and check if it has even degree. If all the vertices have even degree, output yes. Otherwise, output no. Now you might say, what does that have to do with Eulerian cycle at all? But it's a theorem, proved by Euler, that this algorithm correctly solves the problem. OK, you can try to prove that yourself. It's not too hard. So this amazing algorithm solves this problem that's very similar to Hamiltonian cycle. And this algorithm runs in time, well, maybe n squared, depending on how you look at it. If you, for each vertex, you have to count all its neighbors. It's like n times n. Or if you had a different format, it might take O of n time with the adjacency list. I don't want to get into these details, but it's like either n or n squared. So it's much faster than exponential time. So, I mean, let's get to the idea that, you know, there can be a big difference between two similar looking problems. Okay, number six, polynomial time. So that means time n to the c for some constant c. And there's something truly magical about the notion of polynomial time. It's a very important definition in computer science. So you remember this plot, and one thing we saw, saw from this plot is that there's a pretty big efficiency chasm between these running times that are polynomial in n and these ones that are exponential. And that's true. But that's not the real reason I think that polynomial time is like a magical concept. The real reason comes from this example of Hamiltonian cycle and Eulerian cycle. This one, we didn't know any algorithm except for an exponential time ones. And it sort of corresponds to the fact that we really don't have a good understanding of what it means for a graph to have a Hamiltonian cycle. Like, pretty much all you can do is just like try a lot of possibilities. But for Eulerian cycle, where we do have a polynomial time algorithm, it's because we had this like brilliant theorem of Euclid that was, like very simply characterizes when a graph has an Eulerian cycle. So it's the true awesomeness of polynomial time is it seems to correspond very well to understanding a problem. There's an enormous understanding chasm between problems solvable in polynomial time and those solvable in exponential time. So in fact, a particular sort of common progress paradigm, if you're working on a really tough problem and trying to come up with an algorithm for it, is like this. First, you're like, well, there's a brute force algorithm. You know, I try to check all the possibilities, whatever that means for your particular problem. And usually, that's exponential time. Then maybe after many years, there's like an algorithmic breakthrough. And finally, you can show that the problem can be solved in polynomial time. You know, n cubed, or n fourth, or n squared, or something. And then sometimes, maybe even after more years of blood, sweat, and tears, you can make it, let's say, linear time or n log n time or something. And this is very important. I mean, it's a key area of algorithms research. But somehow I feel at a higher level, like the real magic is happening here. When you go down from like, you know, a brute force algorithm, you're like, I don't know anything. I'll just try everything to a polynomial time algorithm where you somehow, somehow have some like key understanding that helps you solve the problem efficiently. So uh, there's this idea in theoretical computer science that like polynomial time is equated with efficiently solvable. And this is mediumly true. So let, let me mention, uh, talk about it a little bit. We may ask if a polynomial time algorithm is truly efficient in practice. Suppose you have a linear time algorithm. That's usually pretty efficient. I mean, theoretically, the constant you hit it here could be a billion, but it's it's. That's usually efficient. And similarly, n log n time algorithms, if you run them, you can solve, them, uh, you can solve you know, problems with huge values of n on them efficiently. n squared, kind of efficient. n squared algorithms you can sometimes run in practice. And you know, n better not be a trillion, but it's usually kind of efficient. And it's often hard to distinguish between these, depending on your exact model of counting steps. n cubed, mm, maybe. You know, if n is 1,000, maybe it's OK. If n is a million, it's not going to be in great shape. But it's kind of efficient. n to 100, yeah, that's polynomial time. But you're never going to run that, even for n equal to like 2. However, that's a very unlikely case that you'll like prove an algorithm runs in time like n to the 100. Okay, So uh, sometimes polynomial time algorithms mean efficient. But a good thing about this definition is that it's uh, negatable. You know, It's like a falsifiable notion. Uh, because pretty much if some algorithm is not polynomial time, it's not efficient. Okay? 2 to the n is basically a never efficient running time. Okay? So uh, 
Polynomial time is sort of like a low bar for efficiency. You better be at least polynomial time if you're going to truly run in practice. And if you're not, then uh, you're not going to be efficient in practice. OK, so to sum up uh, the reasons why in computer science a lot of attention is paid to polynomial time, it's just because after like 50 years of experience, it's proved to be a very compelling definition. It's like a, you know, a necessary lower bar for like, efficiency standards. It's associated with beating brute force. It's very robust to the notion of what an elementary step is. Um, it's easy to work with. Like if you have a polynomial time algorithm with a subroutine call, and the subroutine is also polynomial time, then the whole thing is polynomial time. But if you, you know, have a linear time algorithm, and you call a subroutine, which also takes linear time, then suddenly your algorithm could be quadratic time. So this is also a robustness aspect that's quite nice. And finally, as I said, it seems that like most algorithms where you prove it has a polynomial time running out time, uh, the polynomial is not crazy, like n to the 1,000. It tends to be, I don't know, n or n squared or n cubed or something. Okay, so that's some thoughts on why polynomial time is a great notion and why, you know, if you're trying to stay at a high level, it's a good first idea to decide if your algorithm runs in polynomial time. Okay, great idea number seven. Big O notation. This was invented by number theorists, actually, at the very end of the 20th century, but it's really popularized by Knuth. You know that guy, Knuth, Art of Computer Programming? So he uh, made it very popular in computer science, and it's a very good idea. So as I said, I think you've seen it before, but I'll recap the definition in a quick manner. Let's say f and g are functions that map natural numbers to reals. So we have this notation, f of n is o of g of n. What does that mean? Informally, it means that f of n is roughly, at most, g of n, where roughly means up to a constant factor, and you also maybe have to exclude the small values of n, because we mostly think of n as scaling to infinity. Well, that's an informal definition. The formal one has a lot of symbols. It says that uh, f is O of g if there's some constant c, such that f of n is at most c times g of n. Uh, let's say an absolute value to be careful, except maybe for the first n zero numbers, which you can forget about them. So there's some cut off n0 such that once n is bigger than that, f is at most c times g. There's also a warning here, which is that uh, in this expression, like the equal sign is not really an equal sign. Okay? You cannot break this up into smaller components. This whole thing is like a phrase, f of n is o of g of n. You can make this more formal if you treat this as like a set and use like element of notation, but we're not going to do that. I'm just going to say, this is a phrase, which means this. OK, here's a quick example. If f, the function you care about, is 3n squared plus 10n plus 30, we kind of know that this is a big O of n squared, right? It's sort of, at most, n squared up to a constant. So here's the plot of f. It looks like this. Here's the plot of g. It's a parabola. So it doesn't look that like f is, at most, g. But let's take our constant c to be 4. So then this is 4 times g. And you can see, or at least it's suggested by this plot, that once you get past this point, 4 times g is always beating f. OK, so this point happens to be about 13. So in this case, f of n really is o of n squared, because f of n is at most 4n squared once n is bigger than 13. The c is the 4, and the n0 is 13. Actually, you have to prove that, and it takes a little work. But um, generally, if you have a polynomial, it's O of the biggest exponent. You can also make stronger statements, like if you're being more careful, you might say f of n is 3n squared plus O of n. That means that f of n is dominated by 3n squared plus c times n for some big number c, at least when n is big enough. OK, I'll also mention the other two that came up in class, big omega and big theta. And as I said, if O is like roughly at most, big omega means roughly at least. OK, so formally, this is the definition. 
f of n is at least some small constant times g of n once n is big enough. And it's equivalent to saying that g is big O of f of. Last one is big theta, and it's like roughly equals. And it says that f is bounded between a big constant times g and a small constant times g once n is large enough. Or equivalently, f is O of g and g is O of a. This is like saying f is roughly at most g and f is roughly at least g. So put them together, f is sort of roughly equal to g up to a constant. Any questions? So hopefully you'll get more practice with this. It'll probably come up in like all of your computer science classes, but it's an important concept, so you can see it several times. Uh, when you talk about big O, there's often like you see like a big list of like, you know, n is big O of n log n, that's big O of n squared. Let me just show you some functions in sort of increasing order of big O-ness. n cubed, this is like n to a constant polynomial n to the log n, 2 to the n, 3 to the n, n factorial. Somebody know something bigger than n factorial? Yeah, n to the n is a very good one. Uh, bigger than that, maybe 2 to the 2 to the n. This is exactly like one thing on like the puzzle hunt, right, with Kevin R. Uh, bigger than 2 to the 2 to the n, somebody? What? I don't know what little g is. Huh, all right. Perhaps then, yes. Uh, yeah? Yeah, that's like uh, this one I think you're getting at. It's similar to what you're saying, like, you could do 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the, like, n times. That's very large. There's uh, bigger ones, too. Uh, let's go smaller now. It's smaller than n. What's a little bit smaller than n? No, n minus 1 is, like, sort of theta. Well, it's true, but theta of n. Mm, not even 0.9 times n. A good one that's like a little bit smaller is n over log n. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's you know, infinitely many choices that you can fit between any of these cracks, but... And then you go down to like root n, log n is smaller, log log n. Somebody said 1, which is true. That's kind of the lowest in a way for running time. O of 1 means bounded by a universal constant. Uh, here's one, log star n. That's the inverse of this function. So, you know, like, log n is like the number of times you need to divide n by 2 to get down to 2, or a constant. Log star is like the number of times you need to do log to get down to a constant. Okay, so that's very small. Like, for any number that's less than, like, 2 to the 100, log star is probably, like, at most 4 or something. It's a very slowly growing function. Does anybody know a slower one that's still bigger than 1? Yes? Yeah, that's a well-known one, inverse Ackerman. Here's a slightly less one, uh, log of log star n. thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and as I said, there's like infinitely many you can slip between any two cracks. So like between, you know, just bigger than n times log n is this crazy one, n times log n times 2 to the log star n. You laugh, but this is the fastest known running time for multiplication. <laughs> that was proved a few years ago. Which is pretty awesome, right? It's like multiplication, you know? It's like one of the most basic things we have. And like this totally insane running time is the best one we know. So, yeah, even these crazy things can come up. Okay. Great idea number eight. Let's see how we're doing on time. Uh, if you want to be careful about how many steps an algorithm takes, you'll have to be careful. I'm going to go through this one a little bit. I, OK, this one is about the fine details of counting steps. And for the most part in this class, we don't want to get into the fine details. But I want to say a few things to make you nervous. <laughs> so when we were doing this two fingers algorithm, we were like, I don't know, this one's 1, 1, 1, let's say 3, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Seemed reasonable at the time. So we were like, great, this algorithm is O of n. So now I want to like, make you uneasy. Let's look at this line, high equals high minus 1. Seems like a simple line. We're like, let's call that one step. Seems reasonable. Well, initially, high starts out as the number n. How many bits of storage does that take to write down high? Or to store it in your computer? I'd say arguably it takes like log n bits, right? I mean, 
to write down the number n takes about log n bits. So in your, let's say it also happens to be a power of two. It's not important, but it means, you know, in the computer it would be stored like this, right? One, zero, 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 like log n times. Okay, so now you do this step, high equals high minus one, and if you change, subtract one from this, you get the number zero, one, 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 right? You just, now to change it from this to this, you had to change actually all log n digits. So did that just take you log n time? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so now you might be like, oh, maybe this step takes log n time. I'm a little confused. Okay, let me make you even more nervous. So far it's like, okay, it's like n log n time maybe now. What about this line? Okay, I want to look at this line more carefully. Okay, in this line we access s of low and we access s of high and we check if they're different. And initially low is one and high is n, right? So the computer has to access the first element in the array and the last element in the array. It's probably stored on like a disk or something, right? Or maybe it's stored in memory, but like that's some sort of physical object. <laughs> this is not a joke. Like the, I don't know, you gotta like go from the first part of the list physically to the last part of the list. You have to traverse like n things, like does that take you n steps? I don't know what disks are made of anymore. They used to be cylinders or something. You have to wait for the disk to spin into the right position. I don't know. So then it's like, <laughs> maybe this takes n steps. And then your whole algorithm would take n squared steps, potentially. <laughs> which is disappointing. It used to be O of n. <laughs> now if you're like, hey, polynomial time, man, it's okay. Then, you know, you don't care too much about the difference between n and n squared, but it seems a little unsatisfying, right? You know, there's, there's a fundamental difference between O of n time and O of n squared time. It makes a lot of difference, it seems. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is it really depends on your model. And different people could think different things about what the right model is. Now you want some sort of mix of abstraction and realism and being easy to work with, and that leads to different choices. For example, there's a fairly nice realistic model called RAM model, and I won't define it, but in the RAM model, palindromes really, this two fingers out, really is O of n time. On the other hand, in like lecture 22 or something, we're going to talk about something called the Turing machine model, which is very elegant. And actually, in the Turing machine model, you can prove that every algorithm solving palindromes takes at least n squared time. So that's a bit weird. But I'm just saying it to say that if you really want to get into these details of like counting steps, you have to be quite careful about what the model is, which is another point in favor of polynomial time. Uh, Got like two minutes left. Okay, basically, there is a model that's kind of popular called RAM model. I don't want to get into the details, but the weird aspect of it is on inputs of size n, you assume that you work with registers of log n bits, which is kind of weird because then like the hardware size is like scaling with the input size, which at first you would say doesn't make a lot of sense. But normally you think of being able to store like an index into array in one word, and then it's sort of consistent. So in the RAM model, like, cost one for accessing an array, and you can do any operation on a word of log n bits in time one. I won't formally define it, but like in this model, you can get back to like O of n time for this palindromes algorithm. But you have to, you have to care about these details uh, if you really want to count steps carefully. For example, you can sort integer lists of length uh, n in O of n time in this model. Okay, I just have like a few more slides as our final great idea. This is about something called the strong Church-Turing thesis. Now, much later in the class, we're going to talk about the Church-Turing thesis, but this is the strong Church-Turing thesis. And this is an idea that says all reasonable models of step counting for algorithms are polynomial equivalent. So you might have been stressed before that, like, oh, we had two different kind of reasonable algorithms. On one, something took n time, one took n squared time. And one thing I said was, okay, don't worry too much, because at least those are polynomially related. This thesis was suggested by decades of computer science experiments, and you can actually show things like it's true for Turing machines and the RAM model. Anything that's polynomial time on Turing machines is polynomial time on the RAM model, and vice versa. So it's kind of like suggesting that the details don't matter too much. Now, in the 1970s, people had a clever idea that 
cast some doubt on this strong church Turing thesis. They said about, what about using randomized algorithms? What if your algorithm has the ability not just to execute instructions, but generate random bits? Can that make algorithms run a lot faster? And there are some problems where we know faster randomized algorithms than we know deterministic algorithms. But not too much faster. So there's more research, and in the 80s, uh, people studied randomized computation a lot, and they kind of decided, you know, I think the church, strong church th Turing thesis is still OK. They didn't prove it, but it seems that randomization does not give you more than a polynomial speed up. So people are like, cool, all right, that's great. There's another challenger from the 1980s, quantum computation, which we're going to talk about in lecture 19. And in this model, it's sort of like even more than randomized computation. You're allowed to have qubits instead of bits. We'll explain what that is. And they can be in quantum superposition. This is fully consistent with the laws of physics. No, it really is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, in light of research from the 1990s, you expected maybe this to go the other way. But uh, in light of this research, we actually believe that this strong church turing thesis is not true. That quantum computation can give you more than a polynomial speed up over all the other kinds of algorithms you normally thought of, which is kind of awesome. We just need to actually build these quantum computers. <laughs> so uh, you might have said, hey, well, isn't this one of the great ideas? But sometimes a great idea can also be wrong. <laughs> so you got to watch out. OK. Uh, I think you can get your quizzes now, too.